Good morning. It's good to be with you this morning. It's great that there's a lot less snow this morning than the last couple of days. I wasn't sure if it would be skiing here today, um, but it's great to be able to gather for worship together. There's an AGM, so we have a once a year short meeting at the end of this service. So if you can stay for that, that would be appreciated. Um, it's hopefully no more than 10 minutes. Maybe less is my hope. Um, but if you're a member here, we'd love you to stay. And if you're a guest or a visitor, this normally doesn't happen. So you're here on the one Sunday where this happens. Um, and the rest of the service will be, uh, be normal, um, apart from that last bit. Um, Alpha is running this evening at half past six. So if you have questions or you'd like to explore Christianity or to look at what Christians believe, we'll meet in, in the in mosaic, in the porch um, for that. And also at half past six tonight, there's a prayer meeting in the Bernie Room. And so we'd love you to come for either of those and be part of that um, in, uh, on our worship today. Those are all of our announcements, which is nice, um, considering some of the previous announcements in other weeks have lasted for a long time. Psalm 34 tells us that the lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, my children, listen to me, the Lord says. You have this picture of in God, we lack nothing. Everything that we need is provided for. Everything that we need is taken care of by God. Peter is leading us this morning. Good morning. It's great to have you with us as we meet in worship together and also as we continue our thoughts in the book of Esther as we uh, hear from Reuben later. Let's start our service in praise as we stand and sing, Lift Your Eyes to the Lord Your God. Hazel up to do some actions for us. 
Um, but she doesn't want to be on her own, so I'm going to invite the kids up as well. And if they want to come, just stand in front of us here. Hazel so will keep you right on the actions. It's our God's great big God, one that you will know well. And uh, it'd be cool to have as many of you up who would like to join us. <coughs> yeah, come just... And if you're shy and don't want to be on the camera but want to join in, you can always follow Hazel up at the front as well. Okay. Well done. Let's pray together. Dear God, you are the great big God. You are far larger in scope and in size and in power than anything else. You are also far greater in your love for us than anything else. We thank you that you love each and every one of us. That you love us so much that you sent your son Jesus for us. That you are a God who is simply greater than anything else. Father, we thank you that in you and your greatness and your goodness, that when we seek you, we lack no good thing. That you provide for us, <coughs> that you take care of us, that you even use us to do your good in the world, that you partner with us. That is, your plan is to partner with human beings, people who love you, people made by you and brought into your family to do your work in the world. Father, as we pray this morning, as we gather for worship this morning, we pray that you would help us to see you clearly and to know that it is you who we see. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you that in Jesus, we can see and know you, that in relationship with Jesus, we have the inheritance of life everlasting, to be where you are forever. Father, as we gather today, we are online and in the building, and we have all sorts of things happening for each of us. 
Some of those things are seasons of blessing and goodness, and some of those things are seasons of trial and difficulty. Father, we pray that we would see you clearly and see you foremost above everything else and upon seeing you and knowing you and calling upon you. We will see that you are good, but also that all of the other things in our lives find their proper place when we worship you. And so we ask for your help today to worship you. We pray for the boys and girls who are about to go out to glow. We pray that they would see you clearly, that they would know you, that they would come to know you in their lives and spend lives of love, loving you and others as a result. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name and the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Boys and girls, if you'd like to go out. I can't see. They'll be fine. There's people there. It'll be grand. The, the building work means you can't go any further, so that's um, they're readjusting to that. We're going to um, give to God um, our offering, and as we do that, we're going to sing. If you're a guest or you're new, this isn't an admittance. You don't need to give anything. That's not how it works. That's not how church works at all. It's a response of people who, who know Jesus to be able to give towards the work of the church. Um, but it's not an admission fee, so I don't, I don't want you to feel any pressure about that. And as we do that, we're going to sing. Thank you, Peter. Just keep your, uh, keep your seats. <laughs> feel free to move. No, 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 just keep your seats, it's all good. <laughs> Here I am waiting, abide in me, I pray. Here I am longing for you.
David is going to come and lead us in our prayers for others. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege of speaking directly to you in prayer and knowing that you hear us. Father, we can only do that because of Jesus' atoning sacrifice on the cross. Forgive us for the times that we take this access to you for granted and when we are complacent in our prayer lives. Thank you also for the freedom to assemble and worship openly in this country. We remember our brothers and sisters in persecuted countries who cannot do this. In many parts of the world, to be a Christian comes at great personal risk. Please bless and protect our brothers and sisters in the persecuted church. Strengthen them in their faith. Help them to hear clearly from you and protect them from those that would seek to do them harm. We pray for our ministry team. Bless Reuben as he prepares your word each week for the Sunday services. In the midst of a busy family life, would you help him to carve out the quiet periods when he can hear from you? Lord, would you continue to speak clearly to Reuben so that he will be nourished in his own faith and that he might in turn minister to our congregation? We thank you for Glenda and for her personality and gifts. Thank you for the support that she is to Reuben and for the great team that they make. Surround the McCormick family with your love and power in the heavenly realm. Protect them from the evil one as they do your work in Glen Gormley. Thank you for the ministry support from the Reverend George Moore. Um, we are so grateful for his consistent and humble ministry. Thank you for the encouragement and wise counsel that he offers to Reuben. Thank you also for Valerie, who so clearly reflects Christ. It is so hard to comprehend that the war is still raging in Ukraine and affecting the lives of so many people. Father, forgive us for our fatigue and complacency in regard to praying for this situation. We know that you care for each one of these people infinitely more than we do. We plead that you would still Putin's hand and bring fighting to an end. We humbly ask all these things in Jesus' name and for your glory. Amen. Thank you, David. Thank you. And so we continue in Esther. Um, I'm aware there's some guests, so let me explain some of the story where we come to today, because if you don't know what came before, this will probably shock you that we're reading this today. So Esther is a story in the Bible that's set two and a half thousand years ago. Uh, they, at the end of Esther, they celebrate the festival of Purim, which Jews still celebrate today. In fact, they celebrated it just this past week. Um, this year, and they were celebrating the story of Esther even two and a half thousand years later. The story of Esther is a story of God moving, but God is not mentioned. So in the, in the book, in the Bible, God is not mentioned at all. And what happens is God moves in Esther's life in ways that aren't always great, if we're honest. Some of, the, some of the circumstances are incredibly tough, but God uses Esther's life and Mordecai's life to save the entire people um, of God's people of the Jews. So we're going to look at a section of that today, but I'm just, I'm just conscious that if, if you haven't been in church or you haven't heard any of Esther, you'll go, what are they reading? Um, so that's a little bit of context as we come to this. It's in the Pew Bible in Esther chapter 7, and it hopefully will appear on the screen as we read this. And Esther 7 says, So the king and Haman went to Queen Esther's banquet, and as they were drinking wine on the second day, the king again asked, Queen Esther, what is your petition? It will be given you, what is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be granted. Then Queen Esther answered, if I have found favor with you, your majesty, and if it pleases you, grant me my life. This is my petition. And spare my people. This is my request. For I and my people have been so sold to be destroyed, killed, and annihilated. If we had merely been sold as male and female slaves, I would have kept quiet, because no such distress would justify disturbing the king. King Xerxes asked Queen Esther, Who is he? Where is he? The man who has dared to do such a thing. 
Esther said, an adversary and enemy, this vile Haman. Then Haman was terrified before the king and queen. The king got up in a rage, left his wife and went out into the palace garden. But Haman, realizing that the king had already decided his fate, stayed behind to beg Queen Esther for his life. Just as the king returned from the palace garden to the banqueting hall, Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was reclining. The king exclaimed, Will he even molest the queen while she is with me in the house? As soon as the word left the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs attending the king, said, A pole reaching to a height of 50 cubits stands by Haman's house. He had it set up for Mordecai, who spoke up to help the king. The king said, Impale him on it. So they impaled Haman on the pole he had set up for Mordecai, then the king's fury subsided. It's some part of the story. As the action builds across this. Let me remind you of really the key to understanding this story. Which is, which is difficult to read just on its own. But hopefully week to week you've been, been able to see it. So in Romans, later in the Bible. There's a verse in Romans 8 that says. And we know that in all things. God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. It's the idea that God is working in all things for our good. That's what's happening here. It doesn't appear to be good. This instance doesn't appear good. And most of Esther has lots of things that are difficult. But that, I bring you back to this just to hold. And the aim of looking at Esther is that in your life, you begin to think through and consider that in your life, as you're living your life, God is working in your life to do things that are good. Because God works in all things for the good of those who love him. And so we reflect on that. It's not just a story from two and a half thousand years ago. It's really about today. And so if I could play the drums, I would do the drum beats for EastEnders for this. Because this is almost soap opera territory. That's, that's what this is. It's a well-crafted and well-told story. We have another day, another banquet. Really the story of Esther hinges on banquets. It works its way through there are these feasts. Esther has already had one banquet. Then last week we looked at everything that happened during the night. We come to the next banquet. Esther is the host. She's really shrewd in this story. She's really wise and she bides her time and she's very intentional and careful. But as she's doing this, Xerxes knows that she wants something. Something is happening here and he's trying to find this out. So Xerxes says, what is it that you would like up to half the kingdom? This isn't a literal statement. He's not going, I'll give you 50% of everything and you can be. Uh, It's not that. But you get the sense of, of liberality, of generosity. I will give you anything you want. There's other historical evidence that at times kings would say this and people would ask for armies. They would ask for huge things because the king is saying, I'll give you whatever. It's a sign of his wealth that he can give big things. And so Esther here is so smart, she's really quite cute. If I have found favour with you, your majesty, and if it pleases you, grant me my life. You move from, I'll give you anything you want up to half the kingdom. Well, can I just be alive, please? This is my petition. And spare my people, this is my request. For I and my people have been sold to be destroyed, killed and annihilated if we had merely been sold as male and female slaves, I, would have kept, I wouldn't have brought that to you. If you were going to enslave all of the Jews, I wouldn't have brought that to the king. She's really shrewd about what she does. She's been really wise. That wouldn't be a distress to bring before you, but the fact she's going to die. If I have found favour, keep me alive and spare my people. She hasn't revealed her ethnicity to this point in the story. In fact, the king isn't even aware that the target of Haman's plan is the Jews. They're just named as people in chapter 3. There is a certain people. The king says, let a decree be issued to destroy them. Do with the people as you please. Xerxes, in his fickleness and in his, he really doesn't care. You get the portrayal as a king. He's really not being a king at all. He doesn't even know who they are. They're not named to him. They're in the rest of the story. Other people know who it is, but the king doesn't know. But Esther knows because she quotes directly from what happened earlier in this story. They are to be sold, to be destroyed, killed and annihilated. And the sold is the bit where Haman offers him a huge amount of money to be able to do this. It's the idea he's negotiated this. 
Xerxes is looking at his queen, one of, as the rabbis call it, the four most beautiful women in the history of the world, and he has promised her anything she wants, and she would like not to die. It's a fairly low bar for gifts that you might consider if you're going to buy something for somebody else. That you know, What would you do for them? Well, sure, we'll, we'll not die. And so the king's response, he's very in the moment, King Xerxes, who dares to do this? And as the story plays out for such a time as this, an adversary, adversary and an enemy, this vile human, this person who is number two in the kingdom, he is the noble above all nobles, he has boasted about this in his own family, he thinks he is the boy. He just thinks he's brilliant and he is the one behind this. Haman is then terrified. The king leaves in a rage. Again, Esther tells the story really well. We don't know the king's motivation. So some of the commentators have fun with this. So is he just furious? How dare somebody do something against Esther? Is, does he storm out because he's thinking that ultimately this was his edict? It was his law that he signed to have his, king, have his queen done away with and he just doesn't pay any attention. He hasn't been focusing on what's happening. And oh my goodness, she's going to find out that I'm the one behind this. He signed off on the paperwork. We don't know. Is the rage at how does he pick a second wife? So Vashti ended up getting rid of Vashti because she wouldn't do as she wanted. Now Esther comes before him and he's, we don't know his motivation. We don't know his mindset. But in verse 8, you have this great scene as the king comes back in. Haman is left begging for his life with Queen Esther. And it says, Haman falls on the couch where Esther is. And the madness just explodes from Xerxes because it's right in front of him. Will he molest the queen with me here? Will Haman in his vileness and his evil try to rip the queen whenever he's in the garden beside this? One of the Jewish commentaries is, the Jews have a very interesting take on a lot of Esther. It's, it's very humorous. But one of them sees, because God is throughout this story but not named. And one of the commentaries has this idea that an angel nudges Haman under the bed. Because he's begging for his life, but God is at work in the story. And it's like, there he goes. He falls over just as the king comes in and his fate is sealed. It amused me as I read it. it was a, it's not in the text. It's just part of their discussion as they debate Esther and engage with it. That is the final straw. And so as it simply says, they cover his face. If you've seen any gangster movies at any time, it's the balaclava over the head. It never goes well when that happens to somebody in the story. When they're captured and the hood goes over them. They're not going home. That's what happens here. And Harbona, winner of, I think, the most helpful eunuch, just happens to say, a pole reaching to a height of 50 cubits stands by Haman's house. He had it set up for Mordecai, who spoke up to help the king. He's a really helpful eunuch. He's just nudging the story along. I wonder what we could do with this huge pole that he was going to kill the person who saved your life with. And then Haman is impaled on it. It's funny, in the last month, I've had more people speak to me about how the impaling happened than almost anything else. Um, it's funny what captures our imagination in the story. Was it a pole? Was it 70? Was it 25 metres high? Was he hanged? Was he impaled? You, don't, you can play about with that for the rest of the day. It doesn't actually matter. He dies on this. And the king's wrath subsides at the end. That's how the chapter finishes. Him and is killed. The evil is dealt with. And the, and the wrath subsides. So what do we do with this today? What do we do with this ancient story that's two and a half thousand years old? And what does it have to say about our lives today? Not too many impalings happening in Newton Abbey. Not too many hangings. But even if you don't have faith today, I think this story gives us wisdom. So even to initially look at it just in the point of view of a story that we can learn from. As we read this story, we are reminded that evil is real. It is not a, a fiction or something far off and removed or a myth. Haman began being angry at one thing in the story. Haman was angry because somebody wouldn't bow down when he passed by. That's what led to this moment in his life. Mordecai didn't bow and Haman's anger and rage ended up enabling the genocide of a people in 127 provinces across the Persian Empire. That's where his pride and ego lead him to. It's a bit of a crazy story in the sense of this thing happens over here and where anger just runs. 
At the heart of the Haman story is pride and ego. He is slighted and he just refuses to let it go and it builds and builds and builds and becomes this other thing. But we live in a world where evil is real. In the past number of weeks, we have discovered that the new IRA work with loyalist paramilitaries in order to kill police officers. So for years, the politics that we're told are green and orange, when behind the scenes, the gangsters work together in order to do what they're doing. Evil is real where we live. It's not about the colour of the flag. It's about selling drugs and selling people. It's about criminality and gangsters. That's the reality of where we live. And when you see it on the headlines, you're thinking, oh my goodness, the police weren't shocked when they arrested the people. They were the ones that were going, yeah, we've arrested some people here and some people here. And people outside of that world were going, hang on, what do you mean they're all on the same team? And the police are going, they're all just criminals. They're gangsters. They're selling people and drugs. That's what they peddle in. And you're thinking, hang on, this, the narrative we've been told for most of our lives is not the narrative that's happening. I worked with a lady once, no, no, didn't work with her. I knew a lady who worked in North Belfast, and she spoke to me about how drugs come in at Divis, and she named the bars and the falls that they go across, and then they come across Lanark Way, and they go down the Shankle, and then at the Shankle it splits and moves to North Belfast, and goes into the Ardoin and up into Ballysillen. Interesting, you wouldn't put the Ardoin and Ballysillen together for many things, but for drugs they do. And then it comes across onto the Antrim Road, and moves down onto the Shore Road, and from the Shore Road it moves into Rathcool, Monkstown, and on out towards Carrick. And so we have cross-community drug dealing. But on the ground, that's not what's being told. Evil is real. I was astounded that this lady knew this. I was thinking, I, she wasn't connected to anything. It was just a widely known reality of how things move across the city. Changing communities, changing sides, no. Because people sell drugs and terrorize people. Evil is real. We see cases all the time, particularly in the last six months to a year, of people just committing acts that are evil on babies, on infants, there's court cases regularly and often of people doing unspeakable things to vulnerable people. We see it repeatedly and often. It doesn't get any better. For all the advances in civilization in the Western world in the 21st century, this is still ongoing and is happening for decades in family structures where people keep doing this. Across this island, there has been long-term abuse of children for centuries. Globally, we have Putin invading Ukraine, Attempt, attempting to take over a country, leading to the deaths of hundreds of thousands of people at this stage. There is evil and it is real. It is full often of pride and ego and greed. It leads to these huge acts, but at the heart of it, there is a heart issue where somebody just wants something from somebody else and they don't care. So you can say Haman and his genocide in 127 provinces is ridiculous, but at the heart, it was ego and pride that began a journey that ended up somewhere else. So what are we to do in this? It depends on what you believe is happening. So at the two extremes on either side is that God is over everything. That everything is under his control and it's all fixed and there's nothing we can do. Which leads to a sort of God fatalism. God's in charge. doesn't matter if we do something or not do something. God's in charge. And at the other side is that God is doing nothing, or God is unable to do anything, and it's all in us. Those are the two extremes. So some people will say, well, God's in charge, and it will just be what it will be, and we have no action in that. And at the other end, God is irrelevant, and it's all on us, and the human project is failing, because, well, we're not able to fix this, but God is nowhere. I hope, I do hope that you know that God chooses to work in partnership with people. So the two extremes, neither are actually true. God is in charge, but actually people have a role to play. And you find that. You find that where we live, we have the ability to be involved in the world when evil is the reality of where we live. God chooses to work with human beings. I think I've said this before from here. I think there's probably better plans, but it is the plan that God chooses. Because I think I'm very unreliable, and I don't mean to be rude, but you're quite unreliable too. But yet this is how God chooses to shape the world, by using people to do his work. So at some point you have to reconcile that we have a role to play and God is active in the world. The second thing to name is that being quiet serves the villain. You can't heal 
what you can't say. And if you can't say it or won't say it, then nothing will happen. Silence serves the villain. In Esther's story, if she is silent, nothing will change. There's a point a few weeks ago we looked at the story where she goes into the king. She says something. She doesn't say something. That's, that's, her, that's her decision in the story. But being silent, silent allows the other thing to continue. Silence only serves the villain. It's just how it works. If you've ever had a bully in work, or you've had somebody who's awkward, or somebody who's doing something they shouldn't be doing, until somebody says something, it just continues. The first step of changing something that is evil or wicked or not right is saying something, is naming it. It's like the classic anecdote about Ulster men. I think it's unfair, but I think it might be true as well. They don't go to the doctor. Men, I, think, I don't think it's just men in Northern Ireland. I think it's generally across the Western world. But men often don't go to the doctor. And if you don't go to the doctor and say you have a problem, the doctor can do nothing about it. By being silent, you allow the thing that's not great or the thing that's bad to continue. If you don't say something, you can't take any action to fix it. I think at a minimum, we should be able to say when something isn't right. Because by saying it means that something can then happen. And by saying nothing, then things just continue. We should speak up because our words matter. But then we move to the next bit, which you see really clearly in Esther. Because the risk is real. Speaking up involves risk. Risk of being seen. A risk to yourself. Challenging evil involves risk. At the extreme edge of that, we've seen this recently in the attempted murder of Detective Chief Inspector Caldwell. Somebody who goes to work and says, this is wrong. I'm not allowing this to continue. And he has done murder cases and he has been involved in anti-terrorism cases and anti-gangster cases. But the risk is real. The risk to speaking up and saying no, and he is probably one of the most high-profile detectives in the province, and the risk is not a theory. The risk is real. Esther takes the risk. We see people across society who take the risk at greater and lesser degrees of speaking up when something isn't right. The cost could be huge, but sometimes the cost might just be in your workplace or in your family or on your street of just going, this isn't right. And there will be a cost to that. That risk is not, you can't pretend on a Sunday, it'll all be fine. You may end up not getting a promotion. You may end up not moving forward. Somebody shared with me last week being in a meeting and they spoke up and went, oh, actually, I actually don't agree with this. And they thought they were on their own on the branch. They were completely on their own. It was all going, and then somebody else went, well, actually, I don't think it's right either. And they were naming that high in the moment they find themselves going, there are three people in this room. In a room of 12, they didn't have the majority, but we're not on our own, just to say, this isn't right. But the risk is real and the cost is also real. But how, well you see this even close, even in yesterday. So the government have a policy of stop the boats. That's the policy. Goes on very close ground to the international law. Gary Lineker, of all people in the UK, is now the moral authority on saying something about things. Gary Lineker tweets about this. He then loses his job. Yesterday, there's no sporting coverage in BBC because other people join him. But the risk is real. He's probably going to lose 1.35 million. I've got to be honest, you can say he has money. I don't know if he has enough money where 1.35 million doesn't matter. But the risk is real. He spoke up. And if you think, oh, the government policy is okay, you have to go, is the government policy kind? Is it kind to say to people from other parts of the world who are fleeing, you will get moved somewhere else. We won't hear your asylum. You won't have a legal right to remain. You won't be looked after. As followers of Jesus, at some point we have to go, hang on, is this kind? Are we being kind? Is this good? I find it really interesting that we live in a place at the minute where the moral authority comes from Gary Lineker, who sells crisps. <laughs> and yet, he went, said it. He was told to backtrack it. He went, I'm not going to. They went, you'll be suspended. And he went, okay. Because he has some sense of integrity. I can't speak to his faith or even his wider political view other than he went, this is wrong. He's put refugees up in his house. He believes firmly 
that we should be kind to people. I can't speak to his wider character. I don't know anything about him. But on this point that you're watching the repercussions now, somebody wouldn't be silent. The risk is real. You can say he's privileged and the impact is much less on him. But the risk is real. I'm sure, pretty sure he didn't want to be the front of all the papers on Sunday morning. In our lives, sin and evil doesn't tell us that this will lead to your downfall. The sin in your life and the sin in my life doesn't tell us this will go badly for you. That's not how it works. The wrong in our lives tells us to only think of ourselves. At most cases that we've spoken about this morning, somebody somewhere was going, I want what I want. Pride and ego. It's the root of human's downfall. How do we look at this story in light of Jesus? Because that initial part is just really reflecting on the wisdom in this story. In the story we've read today, we have evil and we have the king's response to evil. Even a crooked, shallow king like Xerxes can respond to evil and wickedness. He can take action in that. But as we read this story, I want to suggest the temptation that you, I certainly have this, you might have this. You put yourself in the story as the hero. You put yourself in the story thinking, I would be like an Esther. I would speak up and take action. I would be the person in the story who takes a stand, who resists evil and says something and the risk is real and I will do that. Or you might maybe have less of an ego and go, I'll be, I'm, I think I'm Mordecai. I think I would help Esther in the story. I think I'd be a voice for good within that and help her along. I don't think anybody really wants to be the king. He's shallow. He's, a bit, he's meant to be dopey. You're meant to see that in the story. He's the king of the Persian Empire and he just does what everybody else tells him the entire way through the story. He has no real power at all. I don't imagine any of us really want to consider that we might be human in the story. But stick with me for just a few minutes in this. In your life and in my life, there are things that are not right. There's stuff that we do in our words, in our thoughts, in our actions. There's things that we do deliberately. There's things that we do accidentally. And there's things that we don't do, even though we know they're the right thing to do. That's my unpacking of what the Bible describes as sin. Your thoughts, your words, and your actions. Things that you do deliberately, and sometimes you learn not to do, make those things as obvious, but there's things that you have in your heart or your head or your actions that are deliberate and things that are accidental, things that you do and you didn't really mean to have the fallout that they had. And then there's things that you don't do when you know they're the right thing to do. And on Friday it snowed. And on Friday I put a message in the church WhatsApp saying, maybe there's something you can do today to love your neighbour. And two minutes later, my neighbor was stuck in his driveway. And I looked out and I went, oh, no. <laughs> and I watched him. I'm going to be honest. I didn't even throw the boots on. I watched him for a few minutes and I went, oh, I wish I hadn't sent that text to everybody. <laughs> and I put my slippers on and ran out. And then I had to run back in because I was in my slippers and it was six inches deep. And I realized, oh, this is going to be a bit more of a situation. He was completely stuck in snow. And we got, I'm not trying to talk about me, we got shovels and neighbours. But what was interesting was other neighbours came out. So it became like a whole wee boys club of, how, does anybody know how to get a car out of ice? And we don't know how to do it, but we got them out eventually. But I name that in the sense of sometimes we see the right thing to do and we, I, I didn't want to do it. I was like, I'm quite warm in our house. And he's like, actually, he'll just go back in. That could be grand. Oh, no, I, I love your neighbour. Maybe there's a way you can love your neighbour. Oh, I'm going to have to go out. And even when I knew it was the right thing to do, I didn't really want to do it. Afterwards, I wanted to do it. Afterwards, it was a great bit of, he didn't even know my name. That's how close we are as neighbours. And afterwards, it was like, that was a great moment. And you realise, when you actually participate in the things you're meant to be doing, they're good for you. They're good for me and my street and my neighbours, even having that brief connection. But I named thoughts, words and deeds, and deliberate, accidental, and by withholding, because I think we know those things. We know the things, or we're aware of them at some level, of the things in our lives that aren't right. This is a basic. The danger in our lives is that we minimize the stuff that's not right. The danger for all of us is that we begin to tell ourselves, we're doing okay. I'm pretty good. Haman thought he was pretty good. He thought he was doing all right. He wasn't looking at the stuff in his life that wasn't great, or that was damaging, or was toxic. The stuff that he did deliberately, accidentally, or by withholding. The thoughts in his words, or in his thoughts, or the stuff in his heart. The stuff in his actions. 
We cause damage all of the time. And if you don't think you do, if as I name this, you're thinking, I don't do any of that. I don't do anything with my words, my thoughts, my deeds, and I don't do anything deliberately or accidentally. But you, you do need to look at that because essentially what you've done is make yourself Jesus. So if you think you don't have any of that, actually your ego is so big that you're like, I don't, I don't do anything wrong. That's a very dangerous place to be in your life where you think you're perfect. You just need to talk to somebody who knows you well. They'll tell you, they'll correct you in that view. So somebody who knows you well, if you go, I think I'm perfect, they'll probably have a little list quite quickly. Because we know we're not perfect, but the danger is we begin to kid ourselves a bit. That's just on human standards. In light of Jesus, what we become aware of is in our lives, there's God's level of living correctly, of living in order, of living ways that are perfect and holy in our words and thoughts and deeds, in our deliberate actions, our accidental actions, and also in the things that we withhold, you don't withhold. Because God's standards are so much higher than ours, and the danger is we begin to judge God by our standards when his standards are so much higher. The similarity in the Esther story is that the evil and pride and ego in Haman's life ultimately leads to death. That's what happens. The consequences of him doing evil ends in his death. I need to be honest, the result of the damage and the sin and the stuff that's not right in our lives also leads to death. So the Bible tells us that not living the way that God wants us to live, which we can't do, even if you try to, you can't do it. And this is where there is good news in this story. Haman was killed on a tree. That's so the king's wrath was dealt with. That's how chapter 7 finishes. Then the king's fury, the king's wrath subsided because the evil had been dealt with. Wrath isn't a term you or I use very much. You haven't reviewed your week with anybody by going, there was wrath at any point. It's not a term we use. But the wrong in our lives has consequences and the wrath of the king is part of it. Xerxes is a really bad model for the king. But you see the principle here because what we celebrate today is that God sent Jesus, his son, to deal with the wrath. And wrath is one of those terms that doesn't help us. So give me a second on wrath. Wrath is what happens when you love somebody really well and they're not living the way you'd like them to live. So my two kids are lovely and they are not perfect because I'm their dad and I'm not perfect, right? And at times they do stuff and it catches me off and I'm going, this is not what you're meant to be doing. And that anger comes out of love because you're going, you're not meant to be doing this. You're meant to be looking after each other or being kind to one another. So in the ways, so I, I shouldn't talk about my kids, I should talk about my own life actually, because my brother and I fought for years about anything. Sausages on the plate, potatoes on, it didn't matter what it was, we just fought and bickered as brothers do. And at times our parents would get annoyed with us. But they'd get annoyed not just because of the bickering, they'd be going, this isn't how we're meant to raise you. That anger comes out of love of like, you can do better than this. You can be kind to one another. And what we have whenever the Bible speaks of God's wrath is God is angry because he's going, I didn't make you for this. I didn't make you to live like this. My love for you is such that you would live really, really well, and this is not it. Whenever we think of God's wrath, you can think of a, like a Hollywood picture of God raging across the earth. It's not accurate. It's a picture of a God who loves us, being angry at how we are not living as we are meant to live. There are consequences to not living as we should. God is determined to set everything right. That's his action in the world. It's his action in our lives and across the planet. God is angry against sin because God is getting rid of the corruption of the sin of the damage in the world. But God is so determined to set everything right that he sends his own son, Jesus. God doesn't kill us for our sin. It's not like Xerxes and Haman. Haman just gets taken out. That's not what God does. God sends Jesus who takes all of the anger about what is not right on himself. All of God's loving anger at how you're not living the way you're meant to live goes on to Jesus. God puts the punishment for our wrong on to Jesus and Jesus chooses to take it all on himself. That's God's love in action. That's God not remaining silent at what is wrong. But it is God taking the risk because he is the one who sacrifices himself. 
God is the one who takes the pain. God is the one who is all in in order to fix everything and to set it right. And Jesus is impaled on a pole. He is stuck on a tree and crucified. It's different to Haman, but it's the same principle. Somebody has to face the punishment. And the good news of saying the story of Esther through Jesus is not that we are human, but that Jesus takes the role of taking the punishment on himself. God does this for us. And it shows God's justice because things need to be dealt with, but it also shows God's mercy because God does this himself for us. God steps into that place. God does this for us. And because Jesus has dealt with all of our sin, when we accept him as the Lord of our lives, it isn't as though you've never sinned because that's not actually true. Sometimes maybe I've even said that. It's like you've never said, that's not true. Because what Christians really believe is, I do sin and I am a sinner, but Jesus has dealt with it. Jesus has dealt with all of the damage in my life. He has taken it upon himself. The great news is that you're able to say, I am a sinner, but I am a forgiven sinner. And God's, or Jesus' rightness is not based on how good I am, but it's based on God's grace. So you inherit the goodness of Jesus in our lives. And then because Jesus is at work in your life and your sin has gone to Jesus and his rightness comes on to us, God brings us into his family where we become his hands and work in the world. We begin to resemble the family that we're in. I think Esther gives us a great example of how this works without God. The king who is ropey, the king who is dopey, kills the evil source, but evil continues Evil just continues in the story. We'll look at it next week. It's a really troubling finish in Esther. It's not Disney and Happy Ever After because evil is a reality. But as we look at Esther through the light of Jesus, it reminds us what Christ has done for us, that Jesus takes this on himself. I want to give you a moment just to consider this in your head. So I'm going to invite you to close your eyes and I'm going to invite you just to put your hands out in front of you. You just put your hands out. I'm going to pray two things. One, that God would speak to you. But possibly for you as you hear this, this news needs to come back into reality in your life. Maybe it's to invite Jesus into your life for the first time. Maybe it's to say, Jesus, I don't really live like I believe this. I'm just going to give you a minute just to consider this. We are more like human than we dare believe. But all of that has been dealt with on the cross. Father, you love us so much that you took all of the damage in our lives that we do to others, but also that has come to us. You place it on your son, Jesus, so that we can know the full forgiveness of sins. Father, for some of us, this is a really new concept and understanding of who you are. And so, Father, we pray that you would make that real in our heads and in our hearts. Father, for some of us, this news is too good to believe. And so we pray that you would move into our lives. That you would fall afresh on us, but you would bring us into your family. For some of us, Father, this is in some ways old news, but it has gone cold. Father, we pray for that awareness of your spirit reminding us of how great this news is. That you have done everything for us so we could know the full forgiveness of the sin and damage in our lives, but you bring us into your family and into new life. Father, we pray for an increased awareness of the reality of your spirit in our lives. Come, Lord Jesus, come. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. The band are going to come and give us time to respond to Jesus.
one of the things that we come across as we read through Esther is that we we kind of know where the story's going. We've heard it before. We know what the ending is going to be. We know that God will be faithful. We know that he will save his people. But Esther didn't live with the knowledge of the end of the story. She had to face that not knowing what tomorrow would be. And so I kind of wonder, what were the stories that her and uh, Mordecai drew on to give them hope as they faced their tomorrows? What was it that reminded them that God was faithful and active yesterday, that he would remain faithful and active today, and that he would still <coughs> be faithful and active tomorrow? We live in uncertain times as well. We don't know what our tomorrows will bring, but we do have the stories that give us hope. And as we come to our time of worship and response, we want to carry that hope in our hearts as we remember God's faithfulness and that he is with us. He was faithful and active yesterday. He was he remains faithful and active today, and he will be faithful and active tomorrow. Let's stand and praise God. <laughs> Hey. Yeah. Yeah. 
say the grace to one another if you know it may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all